our lives. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. If you missed Sunday, you missed a powerful service. The Spirit of the Lord was here in a great way. We don't ever want to take a service for granted. Let's open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Brinson, good to see you tonight, my friend. God bless you. Appreciate you. We're glad you're here. Exodus chapter 20. We're going to begin reading with verse number 1. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. Of course, the book of Exodus is the story of the exit of the people of Israel out of Egypt. What a fascinating book it is. Moses is the writer, and he says this. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You may be seated. Please keep your Bibles open, and I want to continue reading. My reading is rather lengthy, so I don't want you standing any longer than you have to. Verse 3, notice what he says. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, and then he goes on to say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Folks, I think that covers just about everything. Look at it again. He said, anything in the heaven above, anything in the earth beneath, or anything in the water, don't fashion any graven image that resembles anything in these three spheres. Verse 5, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. That ought to make your blood run cold if you're not living for God. If you have children and you're not living for God, that verse ought to make your blood run cold. That your transgression could curse your children to the third and fourth generations out. Your great, great, great grandchildren could suffer because of your stupidity. Think about what would happen if we turned that around and said, how much blessing could be on the third and fourth generation if I live for God? What, what progress, what success could the third and fourth generations have if simply I worship God and serve God. Powerful, powerful concept. Verse 6. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's why Christians don't use the name of Jesus in vain. We don't say Jesus Christ in a slang way. We don't say G, GD this or GD that. We don't even go close to using the name of the Lord in vain. Verse 7, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Make sure you write that verse down, underline it. Amen. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea, and all that is in them, all that in them is, rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now in the New Testament, we believe every day is a holy day. Every day is a Sabbath day because we have the Holy Ghost. There has to be a day of the week that we carve out and say this is the day that we we call a church day. That's the day we're going to gather together. But every day is is a holy day. The book of Hebrews tells us that the new way is better and that every day is a Sabbath day. Verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. How many want to live a long life? Well... There's a few things that we can do to live a long life. That is, eat healthy, take some fish oil pills, drink a lot of water, exercise a little bit, stay away from grease, fats, 
Honor your parents. It's in the Bible. Now, the first six things I mentioned aren't even in the Bible, but that last one, that's in the Bible. I believe you could eat Big Macs every day, and if you honor your parents, God's going to bless you. Now, that doesn't mean you need to go out here and act crazy, but there is something about honoring your parents. Verse 13, very succinct, thou shalt not kill. Folks, that's plain. That is infanticide, that is genocide, that is killing of old people, that is killing of feeble people, that is killing unborn babies. Thou shalt not kill simply means exactly what it says. Don't kill. If it's life, it's from God. There, what is all this debate about? You know, No, thou shalt not kill. End of story. For a Christian, that is. If you're a Christian, there should be no reservation in your heart whatsoever about the sanctity of life. Don't even get caught up in the debate in our society about, well, when is life and what is life and how is life valued. It doesn't matter if life starts over here or life's about to end over here. If it's life, it's life. It's God's and it's not our job to take it. Only government has the power to take life, and that's through capital punishment. That is a biblical concept. And even then, we should put such a value on life that we should exhaust all measures to make sure that person is without a doubt absolutely guilty. And our system is faulty, and that's why there have been people on death row for years, and DNA says, actually, they're not the one that did it. So we ought to be careful about taking life. Verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Man, what is this book I'm reading out of? Where is all these old-fashioned rules coming from? Oh, this is the Bible. Am I in the Bible? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Plain and simple. Verse 15, thou shalt not steal. So I didn't steal. I just claimed a few people as independent of dependence on my tax return that weren't really there. That's stealing. I didn't steal, Pastor. I just fudged my time clock a little bit and told the boss I was there for a few hours. I wasn't there because, you know what, he should have gave me off early last week, and he didn't, so I'm going to get my time. That's stealing. When you switch the price tag at Walmart, that's stealing. If the lady at the counter forgets to ring up something and you don't catch it and you are watching it and you should have caught it and you really did catch it but you didn't say anything that's stealing I'm, am I in the Bible? I'm in the Bible verse 16 thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor we don't lie on each other verse 17 thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife <laughs> say well I wish I had the house he was living in well that's not your house that's his house get your own house Work your, work, work your job, get your own house. Thou shalt not covet his wife. I wish I had his wife. No, get your own wife. That's his wife. And if you have questions about that, read verse 14. Don't covet his manservant. Don't covet his maidservant. Don't covet his ox. Don't cover his uh, donkey. Just so we're all on the same page with that word. Don't covet anything that is thy neighbor's. Now, I've slowly taken some time and read these verses because it all goes back to verse number 2. I am the Lord, thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Tonight I want to teach for just a few moments, and I will be mindful of the time as much as possible. I want to talk to you about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The word Lord is not commonly used in our speech today. We use uh, words like boss, supervisor, foreman, manager, overseer, director, administrator, leader. Some of these words I looked up in the thesaurus, but uh, none of them actually convey the exact meaning of the word Lord. You wouldn't call your boss Lord. You wouldn't call your overseer or your director or supervisor Lord so-and-so. In the scriptural sense, the word Lord describes someone who does more than just guide or advise or direct or manage people. It's a deeper meaning than just supervising. It's important we truly understand what we are saying when we proclaim 
Jesus is Lord. When we say that, we're not just saying Jesus is my boss. Jesus is my director. Jesus is my HR supervisor. Jesus is my manager. Jesus is my foreman. No, no, no. When we say Jesus is Lord, it's a completely different level than any of that. You see, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, and the English languages, all three, the word Lord has several different meanings and connotations. The first one that I read up, I read up on was the word Lord has a meaning of royalty. Royalty. In ancient cultures and a few cultures that remain today, to be a Lord is a designation of aristocracy, nobility, or royal blood. In England, if you are called Lord so-and-so, that's not a sacrilegious term that they're placing on you. They're actually saying this person has noble blood in their veins. This person can trace their lineage back to the aristocracy of this country. They are noble. They are royal. In those cultures, a Lord often is someone whose family was related to the ruling king. Lords were privileged members of the ruling class. They were honored and they were respected because of their eminence and their high birth. And lords were not allowed to marry down. They had to marry evenly or up. There's a big brouhaha in England going on right now over a certain prince who married a certain actress. And the queen said, no, that ain't going to happen. I'm going to tell you, you don't mess with Queen Elizabeth. She's been reigning 70 years and she knows her stuff. And that certain prince and that certain princess are no longer a part of the royal family now. And they're earning their living by publishing memoirs about the royal family. Stay tuned. Let's see how that goes. Secondly, the word Lord carries the meaning of rulership or authority. So not just nobility, not just the aristocracy, not just uh, related to uh, royal blood. The word Lord carries the meaning of rulership or authority. In ancient cultures, a Lord was someone who was obeyed absolutely, utterly, and completely obeyed. There was no question. To not obey meant your life was put at risk. In many societies, Lord had the power of life and death over their subjects, and to disobey a Lord's order was certain death. So they were not just a boss or supervisor. They were an absolute ruler, and they would not have their dictates questioned or challenged. A Lord was someone who has complete authority and control over another with or without that person's consent. And the third meaning, and I bring this out of the Hebrew language, the word Lord carries the connotation of holiness or divinity. So not just royalty and nobility, not just rulership or authority, but in the Hebrew, the word Lord means holy or divine. The Hebrews referred to their God as the Lord with a capital L. Not just a Lord, but the Lord. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His name was so holy, they would not even speak it and they wouldn't even write it. They just referred to him as the Lord. When the Hebrews spoke of the Lord, of course they were referring to the almighty God. Not just the mighty God, but the almighty God. And if he's got all might and all power and you're not serving him, then by connotation you are serving another deity who doesn't have any might and any power because if he's got it all, they got none. So we ask the question tonight, who is this Lord? Well, let's look at Moses' writing in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 when he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You see, the Jews knew only one Lord. They recognized, they recognized the absolute spiritual authority of only one, and that was the Yahweh God. That was, that was God himself. The Jews didn't serve a trinity. 
Stop and think about that for a moment. There was no connotation, no discussion, no idea, nowhere in the Old Testament of a trinity. That's a man-made thing. Say, so why don't you folks believe in the Trinity? Because it's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Old Testament. It's nowhere in the New Testament. It was invented by the Catholic Church, which did not exist in the Old Testament. And if you go back and ask an Orthodox Jew about the Trinity, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. They're going to quote Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. How do you Gentiles get three out of that? Are y'all stupid? There's one. How do you get three out of one? There's one. They understood that. They still understand that. Amen. Jesus Christ in the New Testament declared himself to be that one absolute Lord. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, in Luke 4, 12, he rebuked Satan by quoting the word of God. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now if you're a Trinitarian, you have problems with that verse because to you, Jesus Christ is the second person in the Trinity and the Father God is the first person in the Trinity. But when Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus rebuked Satan by quoting the word and said, don't you tempt the Lord. Jesus called himself the Lord thy God. You're not getting it. He told Satan, I am your Lord and I am your God. Don't forget, I kicked your tail out of heaven. Don't forget, I ran you out, buddy. I'm still your Lord. I'm still your God. I know you don't serve me, and I know we're here in the wilderness, but I'm your Lord. I'm your God. In that one remarkable sentence, Jesus was not only rebuking Satan, but he was reminding him, I made you. I created you. How dare you tempt me? I'm still your Lord. It's almost like an old father rising up nose to nose with his little punk son and saying, I'm still your daddy boy and I'll take you out. Jesus. 30 years old, stood nose to nose with Satan and said, I'm your Lord. In that one remarkable sentence, Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Lord from glory. Not only did he say that to Satan, but if you look in John 13, 13, he made this claim of absolute lordship to his disciples. John 13, 13, he said, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well. For so I am. Thomas received his revelation of the divinity and lordship of Jesus after Jesus miraculously walked through a wall, morphed into the room, and appeared to him and the other disciples and held out his nail scars hands. And Thomas put his fingers in the scars. And in John 20, 28, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, received his revelation on the road to Damascus. And you've heard me quote it thousands of times in 26 years. Acts 9 and 5, Saul is laying flat of his back and he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. A voice, get this, Jesus had already been transfigured. In Acts chapter 1, go back and read it. He had already been transfigured up into heaven. Jesus was gone. Acts 1 and 10, Jesus went up into heaven. Latter part of Acts 1, the disciples got in the upper room. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost is poured back out, thus fulfilling prophecy of John 14, 26. Jesus was no longer present in the flesh with his disciples. Now the Holy Ghost was poured out on them. But eight chapters after Jesus got transfigured into heaven, a voice from heaven told Saul, I am Jesus. Amen. 
Folks, if you don't get excited about the Godhead, your wood is wet. I am Jesus. A voice from heaven said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That word prick there is not a slang, dirty word that people have made it. It goes all the way back to Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to the Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That word prick comes from the original Hebrew, which means gouging your conscience, sticking your conscience as with a sharp, sharp stick. You ever been in church before and the preaching of the word was just making you uncomfortable that's what it means it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks Jesus was saying Saul you can be that stubborn ox out there in the field and the farmers behind you with that sharp ox goad and the more you rebel and the more you halt the more he's going to stick you in the rear end with that big sharp stick come on boy plow this field it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks how many would agree it's hard to kick against Jesus you can run but you can't hide He's going to get you. He'll find you. He'll walk up to you sitting at the bar drinking that Michelob Light. And that will be the most uncomfortable beer you've ever drank in your life. He'll catch you squirreled away watching porn on your phone. And you think you're all by yourself. And Jesus is sitting there saying, what you looking at, buddy? You think you're with that person talking all by yourself, breaking your marital vows. And Jesus is sitting in the corner saying, I'm watching you. He'll get you. He'll get you. He'll get you. You think you're sticking that money in your pocket and nobody's watching. And Jesus is saying, how much was that, a 20 or a 10? You going to pay your tithes on that? You can't run from Jesus. It's hard to kick against the pricks. The Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. You want to backslide and walk away from God, you go right ahead. You'll be back because you'll be so miserable, you won't even, you won't even enjoy sin. That's right. Ask Peter. Peter couldn't even cuss right when he, when he backslid. He tried to cuss and a woman said, your speech betrayeth thee. You can't even cuss right when you backslide. I feel a little oomph in the Holy Ghost right there. The Apostle Peter proclaimed the great revelation in the first message that was preached after the church was born on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.36. Again, if you have your Bibles, let's follow. Here he is preaching. Peter said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Over and over and over in the, in the Old Testament, Yahweh is referred to as the Lord. Over and over and over in the New Testament, Jesus as, is referred to as the Lord. Do we have two Lords fighting up in heaven? No, we got one Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. Not two Lords, there's only one Lord. Ephesians 4, 5. To the spirit-filled Christians, there's only one Lord, and that Lord is God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Now, to whom is Jesus Lord of? Well, he's Lord of all. Even if you won't serve him, he's still your Lord. Friend, if Jesus looked at the devil and said, don't you tempt the Lord thy God, then he's your Lord too. Amen. If he's the devil's Lord, he's your Lord. Right. So he ain't my Lord. No, he's your Lord. Matter of fact, the Bible says, one of these days, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You may not do it today, but you're going to do it one day. You might as well do it while you can. You might as well freely lift your hands and say, oh, my Lord, you are my Savior. You are my King. I freely admit you're my Lord. Whether we accept and obey his lordship or not, he's still Lord. So this is an unchangeable fact. Whether we choose to acknowledge and submit to the lordship of Jesus, he's still Lord. And someday we'll either be blessed or cursed according to our response. The day will eventually come when everyone will finally acknowledge the supreme lordship of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.11, write this verse down. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Now that verse, when I read that verse, that verse is both a blessing and a sorrow. It's a joy and a sorrow. Because those who truly proclaim Him as Lord of their lives, those of us sitting here tonight, those of us watching online tonight, will someday enter into the joy of the Lord. But those who wait till it's too late and are forced to kneel down on this day will discover the judgment and punishment of God. There's a lot of people that claim Jesus as the Lord today. However, Jesus challenges those who proclaim Him as Lord, yet still live their lives like He's not their Lord. Matter of fact, this is what He said in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? See, you can, you can fake your way for a while. But on Judgment Day, you're not going to fake your way. You can fake your way through church. You can fake out the pastor because he's just human. Sooner or later, he's going to pick up on it. But he's human, just like everybody else. And your parents, you know, you can fake your parents for a while. You can even fake your husband or wife for a while. But they're going to pick up on it after a while. Be sure your sins will find you out. But I'm going to tell you who you're not going to fake. You're not going to fake out Jesus. I mean, on Judgment Day, when he opens the books, the faking is over. That's right. Your name's either there or it's not. Lordship demands obedience. We're not accepting Jesus as our Lord until we obey and submit to his word and his will. We're not being truthful when we say that Jesus is our Lord, but we resist the teachings of the scripture. We insist on living life by our own decisions and choices. I'm going to get down where we're living tonight. Jesus is not your Lord if you can't even hardly bring your carcass to church. Just, you know, come on, let's just talk like it's real. He's not your Lord if you can't come to his house. He's not your Lord if you can't come to prayer. Oh, he's my Lord. Well, I haven't seen you in prayer in a long time. How is he your Lord if you can't pray? He's not your Lord if you can't support the church with your finances. He's not your Lord if you're out drinking and drugging and smoking and carousing and going places you shouldn't go to. He's not your Lord if you're listening to music you shouldn't listen to. He's not your Lord if you're involved in relationships you shouldn't be involved in. He's not your Lord if you're watching filth. Here's the question we should ask ourselves every day. Am I submitting every area of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You see, it takes the power of the Holy Ghost living in us to truly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, here's what Paul said. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man, listen closely, no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that's where we stop, and we read that, and we're very comfortable with that. And we say, yeah, I would never curse Jesus. Uh, man, I would never do that. But the verse isn't over yet. Let's keep going. And no man can say Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. You see, that's really the very important part there. We can't claim Him to be our Lord unless we really have the Holy Ghost living in us. So the Holy Ghost gives us the power not only to proclaim Him as our Lord, but it helps us to truly surrender to His Lordship. And I believe we truly can submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost gives us the power to live the life He's called us to live. Don't ever forget, Acts 1 and 8 is still in the Bible. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So it gives us power to live a good life. Are we going to be perfect? No. Are we going to make mistakes? Absolutely. But you know what, folks? You find a place to pray, you ask God to forgive you, and you get up and try it again. Micah said, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Just having the Holy Ghost doesn't mean you're, you're supernatural floating through air. It means you're going to spit like everybody else spits, put your pants on, men like everybody else. Ladies, put your dress on like everybody else. Put your shoes on, comb your hair, brush your teeth. Please brush your teeth. Amen. And, and, and you're going to be human like everybody else. But having the Holy Ghost means that I get another chance. It means I'm going to get up again. It means I'm going to fight the devil. 
It means I've got what it takes to make it to heaven. And that's what it's all about. Does anybody want to go to heaven? Praise God. We cannot choose whether or not Jesus is Lord. You say, well, I'm going to accept Christ as my Lord. No, you're not. He's already your Lord, whether you accept it or not. Your, your choice has nothing to do with it. Remember, if he, called, if he told the devil, I'm your Lord, then he's your Lord. You don't choose whether he's your Lord. Whether or not we choose, he's still our Lord. He's the Lord over all the heaven and all the earth and all the universe. But we can choose to obey him. We can choose to submit ourselves to him. And really the question I leave you with tonight is, who or what are you going to submit yourself to? I've seen big burly men. I ain't submit to that, but yet they'll submit to a pack of beer. Got to have that same case of beer every Friday night. They got to have that case of beer. They got to have those cigarettes. They'll swear up and down. They're not submitted to nobody, but yet they're submitted because they can't even function without that case of beer. The question is, what are you going to submit to? If something's got you so bound, you can't even live without it, I got news for you, honey. You're submitted. Now, when you can kick it and go without it, then you come talk to me about how manly you are. But if you can't live without it, you're submitted. You're whooped. Why not be whooped to Jesus? When Bill Clinton was president, he had several of our apostolic singers, musicians, that would come and sing at the White House. And um, Bill Clinton, many of you may not know this, when he was governor of Arkansas, he used to go to the United Pentecostal Church Arkansas camp meeting every year. And he would sit out in the audience as the governor of Arkansas. And he was mesmerized by the preaching of our apostolic preachers. In particular, Brother Robert Bear, who used to be called the Walking Bible. I've, no, I've known I knew Brother Bear when he was alive. He's dead now. I've got some articles in my office from him. He gave me something when he came by and preached in our home church. I was about 13, 14. I was just mesmerized by him. He could just quote scriptures, chapter, 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 word perfect. He literally was the walking Bible. And I was a Bible quizzer, so I was into that, right? And I remember sitting and talking to him one night after church. Bishop Godair always had a line of people to talk to, and he was the last one to leave, and and that always aggravated all the guest preachers. But we always liked it because we got to talk to the guest preachers. They didn't get whisked away real quick. So Brother Bear's sitting there, and I walk up, and I sit down, and I said, I've memorized the book of Mark. He said, good for you, kiddo. I've memorized Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. <laughs> but Brother Robert Bear would take the pulpit at the Arkansas camp meeting and would just start quoting Scripture. And then afterwards, they'd have a minister's get together in food and fellowship. They would invite the governor to that, Bill Clinton, and he'd sit there and he would corner Robert Bear off in the corner and say, Quote me some scripture. And he'd just quote it. And he was blown away by that. Now, we all know the story of what happened when he got to the White House. We all understand the politics that were involved. But I believe somewhere in Bill Clinton's heart, he still had an appreciation for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost and apostolic church and Pentecost and. And, and, and all the anointing that surrounds that. And so he would invite. There's videos out there. You can watch it. I used to have the, the VHS. I may still have it. But he would invite Pentecostal singers. He would invite apostolic singers from all denominations. The Winans would go and sing. And, and, and one of our own, Sister Mickey Mangan, would, would go and sing every year. And I've heard her say this story. That the etiquette people that would teach you how to act in front of the president would always get the singers together and say, Now listen, after you're done singing, you bow to the president of the United States. And if you watch the video, every single songwriter, every single, single artist would sing, lift their hands and pray, and then turn around and bow to the president of the United States. But Sister Mickey Mangan said, I bow to no one except Jesus. Because she understands, he's my Lord. You can be the President of the United States. And man, that's great. I'm praying for you, but you're not my Lord. He's my Lord. And so she's saying, 
I've seen the video. I've got it. Brother Anthony Mangan sitting at the table. People, are, tears are flowing. And she's saying there's a promise coming down the dusty road. And the Spirit of God was moving. You can tell people are like, ooh, what is this? Man, we feel there's a big old tent out in the White House lawn. And when she got done, she looked at the president and she put her hands together and nodded. She didn't bow. Amen. Why? Because our Lord is different. Our Lord's not money. We don't serve money. Money serves us. We don't serve man. Amen. We don't serve possessions. If you serve all those things, then Jesus is not your Lord. Praise God. When you leave here tonight, you need to make up your mind. I bow to no one except Jesus Christ. I bow to nothing except Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. He's my, he went to the cross for me. Man didn't die for me. Money didn't die for me. Politicians didn't die for me. Only Jesus can satisfy my soul. Let's stand together tonight. How many wants him to be your Lord? He is whether you want him to be or not. But I choose to serve him. Let's pray together right now. Father, on this Wednesday night, I pray that as we part and go our respective ways back into our uh, uh, work, back into the workforce, back into our homes and our neighborhoods, that you'd help us to carry this message with us this evening. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You are my Lord tonight, and I accept that. I'm going to choose to serve you. I'm going to choose to obey you now. I'm going to do it willingly so that I'm not forced to bow later on. Praise God. I make those hard choices right now to get things out of my life that should not be there. I make those hard choices right now to be faithful to the house of God. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I need to be in your house. I make those hard choices tonight to be faithful in my involvement in the house of God, to support the work of the Lord with my finances, to get everything out of my life that would try to usurp the authority of your lordship in my life. I don't want any habits in my life. I don't want any stimuli in my life. I don't want any kind of input in my life whatsoever that would hinder your ability to be the Lord of my life. Praise God. Help us tonight to get our house in order. Help us tonight to get our house in order. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Remember, as you leave here tonight, we bow to no one except Jesus Christ. We respect everybody. We love everybody. But we don't bow to anybody except Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Don't forget the events coming up. May the Lord go with you. Let's have a great week in Jesus' name.